bushy tail. All right, we're back on the record. Show the presence of counsel and the defendant. The jury is absent. Um, before we bring the jury in and continue with the cross examination of the witness, a couple of things I just wanted to hear from the parties about. Um, first, um, when we discussed the additional possible witnesses for the defense, um, I might have missed it, but I don't recall Detective Barba's name. But uh, the courts limited additional cross-examination by the defense of Detective Barba. But I, I did rule and, and um, intend to obviously honor the ruling that um, you could recall Detective Barbara, Barba in the defense case and, and examine him and use leading questions whatever, with uh, respect to whatever remained. So I just wanted to make sure that that was still understood to be the ruling of the court and that's still there. Yes, we understand that, Your Honor. All right, and you're not intending to call Detective Barma? We haven't decided yet. He's out there. Um, if we get what we need from the other witnesses, then we won't. Okay, very well. Um, so that should resolve that issue. Now, um, also, the court recalls that with respect to the current witness, uh, Sheriff Hathaway, there was a motion in limity that was filed, I think, on behalf of the state with respect to that witness. And I don't think we got to that as part of uh, pretrial rulings, but um, I just want to anticipate an issue. Maybe there is no issue. What's the, what's the state's recollection? Then I'll hear from the defense. Your Honor, I think the defense has already started to cross-examine or to question him with respect to whether he was legally authorized to do what he did in Mexico. I mean, clearly he was. Clearly had, he had legal justification. I don't think that's relevant um, to this case anyway because if he did something wrong, that would be a separate issue anyway. It has no bearing on the interview with Daniel here. So I would ask that we not go any further into that at this point or that the court instruct the jury that it's not relevant. All right. Well, what, I, what my intention was, I'll hear from the defense, my intention was uh, questions have been asked. I didn't hear any objection, but just to deal with it on a question-by-question -question basis and uh, see where you go. Yeah, my recollection was we discussed that motion, and that's essentially what your ruling was, was that I was allowed to ask the sheriff questions, and we would see what came up at trial. All right, fair enough. I just want to get that out on the table so we didn't um, let something like that fall through the cracks. All right, if there's nothing else, then we can bring in the jury. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and the defendant. And we can have the witness retake the witness stand, please. I need to go grab him. Good morning, sir. You take the witness stand. Thank you. Good morning. What was that? 
All right, the witness is back on the stand. Um, I always inform every witness who's had a break over the evening that you're still under oath. Okay. Very well. And you can continue with your cross-examination, Ms. Larkin. So I want to talk some about this interview that you did with Daniel in Mexico. Prior to meeting with him, what can you summarize the background information that you had about this case? There's probably a lot of things more than I can summarize, but that there was a killing on... Uh, January 30th of 2023 in the Kino Springs area on a property that pertained to an individual named George Kelly and that um, evidence had been collected at the scene, uh, uh, shell casings and a body had been recovered at the scene. I was informed about various uh, 911 phone calls. Uh, various other communications with Border Patrol, with ra Ranch Liaison Officer. Um, I could be missing some things, but that's, that's it in a, in a nutshell. Did you know where the body was located in relationship to the house? No, I did not. Did you know where the house was located in relationship to the border wall? Uh, no, ma'am, I do not. Did you know about other witness statements before you met with Daniel? I had heard some things. Um, uh, the summary of the 911 calls. Um, had you reviewed a statement provided by a person calling himself Miguel? I don't recall that. Had you reviewed a statement provided by a person named Ramon? No, I had heard about Ramon, but I didn't review a statement. So you weren't aware of what either of those people had said? That's correct. And we talked yesterday about some of the ways that you test the credibility of a witness, right? And what you said, you said one of those ways was comparing a witness statement to other witness statements, right? And another way was comparing a witness statement to the physical evidence, right? That's correct. Without knowing the content of those statements and without knowing the facts on the ground in this case, how were you planning to test Daniel's credibility? I know um, probably as one individual more than anyone else in the sheriff's office about the overall aspects of this case. Since I am the sheriff and I was briefed continually on it, um, I, I did not go to the crime scene. Um, but I can test, for example, that Daniel said that an AK-47 was fired, that he recognized the sound, and I know that an AK-47 was recovered and shell casings from an AK-47, so that's one example of testing the, uh, what he said. Another example was a horse, a reddish-colored horse that he said saved his life that was running next to him when the shooter was on the opposite side of the horse shooting at him, so there was a horse. So I, I don't want to get into what he said to you specifically, but I just want to understand what you had available with you to test his statement. Um, you know some facts about the case, but you don't know where the property is. You don't know where the body was located, right? I know where the property is. Um, you know, I didn't go there, but I know generally where it is. You don't know where it is in relation to the border wall? Um, generally. Okay. You don't know what position the body was found in when he died, right? That's correct. Um, you know that a horse was not shot during this incident, right? Uh, that's what I was told, that there was a horse was not found shot. Okay. Um, another way to test a witness's credibility is to provide photo lineups, for example, right? That would be correct, yes. And to see if they can make an identification, right? Yes. So one way that Daniel's credibility could have been tested would be to provide a photo lineup, including Mr. Kelly's photo and other photos of other people who look like him, right? Well, on the date that Daniel showed up, which we didn't know if anyone was going to show up or the name of the individual, we didn't know the nature of the beast. We didn't know what we had on our hands. So... We were doing this in Mexico. We didn't have every investigative avenue available to us, nor did we know um, what, would he, what would come up in his statement that we would need to compare with. So you weren't prepared to even try to get him to identify somebody? 
We were prepared. We did ask about the individual that was doing the shooting. Um, we did you bring any photographs? Yeah, we, we need to let oh. the witness answer the questions, please. I, uh, can you repeat the question? I can't remember what it was. Did you bring any photographs with you to try to let this witness make an identification no, on photographs? No, not that I recall. You had photographs of this other witness, Ramon, correct? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, one of the detectives may have had photographs of him. You, did you bring any photographs of Ramon to try to do a lineup of Ramon with this witness, Daniel? No, I did not. That would be one way to test his credibility, right? That would be discussing one aspect of a thing that didn't directly involve the shooting, because was, was Ramon was not alleged to be at the shooting, only two individuals, Gabrielle and Daniel. You didn't believe Ramon was alleged to be at the shooting? Not from what um, Daniel said. He said there were two individuals, the group scattered at Duquesne Road, two ran back to the border, which was Gabrielle and Daniel. So, and you hadn't reviewed Ramon's statement, I understand that. Detective Barba had interviewed Ramon, right? I think that's correct, but I don't remember for sure. Were you aware that Ramon was also claiming he was at the scene of the shooting? He was there. Um, I was aware that he was alleged to be part of the initial group of seven migrants that came in uh, going towards Duquesne Road, which was referred as the road to Washington Camp or Mount Washington. And then when they saw a Border Patrol vehicle, they scattered, and only the two individuals were on uh, the area where the shooting happened on the return. That's, that's what I'm aware of. And you're aware of that because Daniel told you that. Is that where that came from? That's, yeah, well, that would be uh, one way that I was aware of that. What was the other way you were aware of that? Um, I, don't, I don't know. That's just yeah, what Daniel was. told you, probably. That's what right? Daniel told me. Okay. So if I told you that Ramon said he was there, and he saw this shooting, and he was with a whole group, and the whole group was present when this shooting happened. That was his statement. That would be something that you would try to compare to Daniel's statement to test his credibility, right? I don't, I'm not aware of what Ramon said. If you're going to test a witness's credibility by comparing his statement to somebody else's statement, you should probably be aware of the other person's statement. Shouldn't you? If a person had the mechanism to do that, I didn't know what I was going to encounter in Mexico on February 15th. An individual did show up. I didn't know who they were going to be or what they were going to say. So I documented what they said. And you didn't do anything to test his statement against other statements that had been put forward in this case, did you? I know the detectives were working on this case, and I, I'm aware that they did that type of thing, pursuing many different avenues beyond what I pursued. So they were doing those kind of things. Uh, which, which detective did that? I don't know. Did you ever review a report from any detective that compared these witness statements to each other? I don't recall reviewing a report that, that did that particular thing. Is it possible that nobody did that? I don't know. I, don't, I didn't review all the reports in the case. During this interview with Daniel, um, we know this other witness, Ramon. He was out there before. Um, do you recall Detective Barba providing his name to Daniel? I do recall Detective Barba providing his name to Daniel, yes. And a better way to test Daniel's credibility would be to ask Daniel who else was with you. Wouldn't that be a better way to do that? I do know that he did describe there was a group of seven. They were scared when they got to Duquesne Road and saw a Border Patrol vehicle, and then two of them ran back. So I know he did a description of who was there. It was a group of seven originally, and then it was weaned down to a group of two after everybody scattered. So that wasn't my question. My question was to test Daniel's credibility, if you have another witness who says he was there, Rather than providing that witness's name to Daniel and saying, do you know this guy? A better way to test his credibility would be to ask Daniel, 
Did you know anybody else in the group? And if so, what were their names? Would that be a better way to approach this interview? Um, I don't know. That's uh, 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 Detective Barba was aware of the name Ramon, so he did ask about that name. And I don't know um, if there was better ways to do that. It's pretty suggestive to just provide another person's name to a witness in an interview, right? Well, um, that was a piece of the case that uh, Detective Barba was aware of, and so he asked that question, and I don't know if there would have been a better way to do that. My question was, is that suggestive? He's already answered that question. He said he doesn't know. So that's the answer. Okay. Let's move on. Did you later, so after you provided, after you did this interview with Daniel, did you record a portion of this interview? Yes, I did. Tell me about that. What, what did you not record? What did you record and why? I would say the whole encounter was possibly, this is an estimate, 45 minutes to an hour. I think that video recording was six minutes and 40 seconds. So it was a summary. Just a thought I had at the end of the interview, if something happened to this witness, if he disappeared, if he wound up getting killed, um, I wanted to have something other than my word and Detective Barba's word that we had actually talked to the witness. So it was a summary of the events of that day, and I'm sure there were things um, covered in the overall interview that wasn't recorded that are not, re that are not captured in that video interview. So you spoke with him for a while and then recorded this six-minute portion after you had substantially finished the interview. That's correct. Before departing, just wanted to create um, evidence that, that this encounter had happened. Why didn't you record the whole thing? Didn't think of it until uh, we were at the end. You didn't think of recording a witness interview? I didn't think of that. I think most witness interviews on the street are not recorded or not video recorded, but I did just think the nature of this individual, he didn't have legal documents to come into the U.S. You know, just thought, is there a possibility I'll never see this witness again? Um, maybe it would be good to do a summary, uh, a little video summary, to show that we had actually met with an individual. And it's standard practice to record witness interviews, and right? Not, not necessarily in my career. Um, most witness interviews are not recorded. When you pre-arrange a witness interview and you have time to plan to do the interview, is it best practice to plan to record that interview? This was an ad hoc situation where somebody may show up. Juan Carlos Rodriguez said he would uh, try to arrange uh, an encounter with this in individual. Um, I grabbed a detective. I went to the location to see if anybody would show up. And we weren't at our office. We didn't have the full range of equipment that we would have at the office. We didn't have like a forensic team with us. It was just me and Detective Barba. And uh, we just did the best we could in Mexico, um, just doing an interview with this witness that did show up. You had your phone with you. That's correct. And you used it to record a portion of the interview. That's correct. Why didn't you just use it to record the whole thing? Um, I didn't think about it. Who is Big Super? Um, he has a YouTube channel. Is this a person that you talked to about this case? I talked Objection to your honor relevance. All right, this is all something new, so let's have a bench conference.
All right. Um, the court's ruled at the sidebar, and you may proceed with your cross your direct examination. Excuse me. Did you make comments to Big Super about Mr. Kelly's case? Um. As the public information officer for the sheriff's office, I try to be transparent and talk to anybody. Uh, this big super individual wanted to do a border tour. And while we were doing that border tour, um, he asked me, what about vigilantes? Do you have vigilantes on the border? And I gave an answer, which I didn't say Mr. Kelly's name. I said, we have a situation where there's a rancher that shot at two migrants and killed one of them, and the other one got away. I did mention that incident, and I didn't say the name George Kelly in that interview. Did you say that he just wanted to go hunt him some Mexicans? No. Um, after that comment, I did segue into a um, collective pronoun, the word they, that there is a type, that they want to go hunt themselves some Mexicans. They want to have the mystique of the Old West and the border get some excitement, and we've had individuals that do that. Like well, there was one called Take the Border Back, a group that just came in uh, not too long ago, a bunch of armed individuals. I told Big Super that this was rare. It was not common, but it does happen occasionally. You told Big Super we caught this rancher shooting at migrants, and then you said that there are people who want to come hunt some Mexicans. You made that statement. Yeah, I just did a kind of colloquial. There are some people that they want to go hunt them some Mexicans. Yeah, I did say that statement. Right that. after referencing Mr. Kelly's case. And I didn't mention uh, Mr. Kelly, but I did generically refer to a type that has that attitude. You didn't say Mr. Kelly's name, but that's who you meant, right? That is who I meant. Thank you. You also tell him something about pet ranchers. What did you say about pet ranchers? Uh, something to the effect that um, there are ranchers that are on speed dial for certain news outlets that um, they will um, interpret everything as a crisis, as, uh, you know, that foreigners are hostile, foreigners are here to do us harm. Um, so I did reference that there are people that can get on the news um, by talking this is sort of crisis mentality, hostile nature of foreigners, uh, rather than them just coming here to work, but that they're here to cause harm. And your implication was that that's totally exaggerated? That, that that's exaggerated? What the ranchers yeah. are saying, exaggerated, right? Yeah, that's okay. my, my implication, yes. You talked yesterday about how you don't get into, you don't really get involved in a lot of cases, even the major ones. I just want to ask you, why did you involve yourself in this case? It was mainly because of the specific nature of the Mexico interview. And I had done so many interviews like that when I worked with the DEA. And I've been going to Mexico my whole life. I was born in Nogales, Arizona, grew up here in Nogales, Arizona. I've been going to Mexico my whole life, in addition to my DEA career, which was largely in Latin America. So it was easy for me to go and talk to an individual in Mexico, whether, whereas for others, it, they may be reluctant to do so. So it just seemed like a natural, easy thing for me to do. That's the only reason? Yes. I don't have anything else, Your Honor. Cross-examination from the state. Yes, Your Honor, real briefly. Um, Sheriff, let me ask you the question about the report and the video or the video recording and the report? Yes. Right, you, you recorded via a report, right, the interview? I rec there was an interview that happened, and then at the end of that interview, I synopsized the interview in a video recording. And there's a report of it on this, right? There's a report about the entire interview, that's correct. And Detective Barba was with you, correct? That's correct. And Detective Barba is one of the detectives on this case, right? That's correct. So if you had any questions or concerns, Detective Barba is there to assist you. That's correct. And you talked about, um, are you familiar with the, where the, the victim's body was found in relationship to the Kelly home? I'm not, I'm not aware of the specifics. You f are you familiar with, comfortable with 115 yards? 
I'm not aware of the specific. It's only is what I've been briefed. I've been briefed to that number, but it's just based on a briefing. Well, let's just give me. A, I'm going to give you a hypothetical. If someone's standing 115 yards away, and there's brush, is it easy to make an identification on somebody? Easy. If you're 115 yards away. There's it brush. It, it depends it on the nature of the terrain. Um, like I, I have a ranch in that same area, and I know what the terrain is like. And it depends. It could be there could be mesquite trees or things between the individuals, or it could be open space. It's hard to say without actually looking at the at the crime scene. And also, too, have have you ever been shot at with an AK forty seven? No. Do you have a lot of officers in, in under your employee that has been shot at by an AK forty seven? No. Also, too, when you, the question is about credibility with Daniel when you're in Mexico. One of the, one of the things you talked about was you, you knew something about the case, so you're asking Daniel to tell me your story, right? That's correct. And you're checking that mentally with the facts that you know that Detective Barba or Detective Ienza told you about the case, right? That's correct. And you gave a couple examples, right? Yes. One example was a horse. Mm-hmm. Is that yes? Yes. One example was... Um, AK-47 being shot? Correct. So in your opinion, did Daniel seem credible to you as you interviewed him on February 15th? Objection, foundation, and argumentative. Sustained. No more questions, Your Honor. Redirect. I don't have any redirect. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, any questions from the jurors for this witness? Here's we have more than one, so we'll go to the bench conference. from three different jurors. I'm going to mark this Hathaway number one. Sheriff Hathaway, do you and Mr. Kelly know each other? And if so, please describe your rapport. Same juror, did you involve yourself with this case for political gains? Uh, that's Hathaway number one. Let's see, there's Hathaway number two. Two questions. In your testimony, you stated that the county attorney's office and your deputy sheriffs were nervous about going to Mexico to interview a potential witness. I'm still not clear on why they would be nervous unless it was not a legally authorized method to interview a witness in another country. Can you please explain again? Second question from the same. Um, one second. Same juror. Based on what you know today and based upon your evidence with Daniel, do you believe he is a credible witness? All right, I've already, I just sustained an objection to that question. Okay, so I'm not going to ask that question. I already sustained an objection to that question. Okay, uh, this will be Hathaway number three from the third juror. Can you state if Daniel Ramirez was left or right-handed? If he you knows. If he knows. Second question, same juror. During interview with Daniel, was he wearing any what seems like new clothes, shoes, jewelry, or electronics? That's it. Question from some of the jurors. Um, Sheriff Hathaway, do you and Mr. Kelly know each other? And if so, please describe your rapport or I would assume your relationship. Um, my family has a large ranch in the same area, Duquesne Road, Kino Springs area, as Mr. Kelly's um, property. 
So it's possible that I've met him, but I don't recall specifically having met him in the area while uh, working on the Hathaway Ranch. Second question, did you involve yourself with this case for political gains? No. Right. Um, additional questions from an additional juror. In your testimony, you stated that the county attorney's office and your deputy sheriffs were nervous about going to Mexico to interview a potential witness. I'm still not clear on why they would be nervous unless it was not a legally authorized method to interview a witness in another country. Can you please explain again? Just speculate, speculating, maybe they hear about the danger in Mexico, that it's dangerous down there and they don't want to expose themselves to that kind of danger, but I don't, I don't know exactly why. And questions from another witness. There was another question from that juror, but I had already ruled on that question before, so I won't ask that one. But um, another question, two questions from another juror. Can you state if Daniel Ramirez was left or right-handed, if you know? I don't know. Another question from the same juror. During the interview with Daniel, um, was he wearing any what seems to be like new clothes, shoes, jewelry, or electronics? No, uh, not that I recall. He was dressed humbly. All right, those are all the questions from the three. Any other questions from the jurors? All right, we have another question from a different juror. Let's get that. We'll go on the sidebar for that. All right, um, we are back on the record. I made some rulings that, um, to the effect that uh, part or some of these questions will not be asked because they may have been asked and answered or for other reasons. But witness having answered questions that I've allowed from the jurors, is there any follow-up question, follow-up questioning um, to the questions of the jurors from the defense? No, Your Honor. From the state? Yes, real briefly, Your Honor. Um, let me talk about, there's a question about the attire of Daniel. Your answer was humbly. Correct. Does Daniel appear to be a, a, a man of means? No, definitely not. Let me ask you, too, about the type of cases that the Sheriff's Department and the County Attorney's Office prosecutes here at the border. Would that be a reason why officers and attorneys would be nervous about going to Mexico? Objection leading, and it exceeds the scope. I'm That's on, I'm on cross, Your Honor. Well, exceeds the scope. <laughs> it's a direct question about the nervousness of people from the sheriff's department or the county attorney's office going southbound. Yeah, I, I think I'll allow it. I frankly, I think it's been asked and answered, but I think he's already answered it. But if there's something new to his answer, we'll hear it. Let me repeat the question. Yes, could you repeat it? Sure. With the type of cases that the sheriff's department and the county attorney's office both investigate and prosecute, be a reason why agents and attorneys are nervous about going to Mexico? Possibly, but I don't know. Thank you. Any other questions from this witness from any of the jurors? Thank you, sir. You could step down. Thank you. The defense can call its next witness. Call Detective Raul Rodriguez.
Thank you, sir. If you come over to the witness stand, please, and have a seat. Whenever you're ready, Ms. Arnold. All righty. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Could you tell us your name and spell your last name for the record, please? Raul, R-A-U-L, Rodriguez, R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z. And you are currently retired, is that right? Yes. What, how, what was your employment prior to retirement? Prior to my retirement, I was a uh, lead uh, investigator for the Santa Cruz County uh, Attorney's Office. Did you become involved in the case involving George Allen Kelly at some point? Yes. Could you just describe your initial involvement in that case? My initial involvement is just to uh, uh, go over... Uh, the reports, uh, information uh, that the sheriff's office investigators had done on that case, and on with the witnesses. And this is regarding an incident that took place on January 30th of 2023, right? That's the date of the incident, right? I believe so, ma'am. You weren't involved on January 30th, 2023, right? No, ma'am. So what did you review initially in this case? Just initial reports as to the investigations that were uh, being conducted by the Sheriff's Office uh, criminal investigation. Were you ultimately tasked with conducting an interview or assisting in an interview of a person named Daniel? Yes. Did that interview take place on or about February 23rd of 2023? Yes. Where did that interview take place? Uh, at the uh, Cassini Port of Entry. Uh, describe to me how that got arranged. That was arranged by uh, various telephone uh, contacts with the victim to, uh, to uh, arrive at the Dean Cassini Port of Entry and with some uh, logistics and phone calls with uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, CBP personnel at the port. And... Is it your understanding that the county attorney's office was able to communicate with the port authorities to allow Daniel to come there to meet with you folks? That's correct. Okay. So that meeting didn't take place in Mexico, right? No. Okay. Um, tell me what you had reviewed or what your background information on the case was prior to interviewing Daniel on February 23rd. Background information was that the uh, county, uh, Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office was conducting a uh, criminal investigation into a homicide that occurred in uh, Kino Springs prior to that in interview. Uh, uh, Danielle was identified as a, as a victim witness in that case, and uh, arrangements were made to speak to Danielle uh, at the port. Were you aware before interviewing Daniel that any other people had come forward as witnesses in this case? Yes. How many other people? I believe two other gentlemen were identified by the Santa Cruz County uh, detective. Okay. So in your review, you were aware of a person named Miguel who came forward, right? Not too much. I didn't know a lot about his background, but I know the, the first name was Miguel. Okay. And had you been able to review his statement prior to interviewing Daniel? No, I did not. Okay. And so you didn't know what he said prior no, to interviewing Daniel? What about a person named Ramon? Were you aware that a person named Ramon had come forward as well? Yes. And same question, had you been able to review Ramon's statement prior to interviewing Daniel? No. Okay, so you don't know the content of those statements, no. right? No. Okay. Um, before interviewing Daniel, did you have any information involving the area where this incident was alleged to have taken place? Yes. What information did you have about the area? That occurred in the vicinity of the Kino Springs at a ranch. At a ranch. Did you, were you familiar with the ranch at all? Yes. How, how so? Uh, prior to my employment Sorry, with the... I don't understand. I'm trying to turn it off, Judge. I don't know why it's doing this. I'll be right back. There was a pinging noise. 
I don't understand either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're not okay. Go there. I can't even make a phone call on that. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, tell me how you were familiar with the ranch property. Uh, prior to my uh, employment with the Santa Cruz County uh, Attorney's Office, I was a lieutenant with the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, and that was my area of, of uh, responsibility jurisdiction through my career was the Sheriff's Office. Keno Springs area? Yes. In general, and out Duquesne Road, that area? Yes. Okay. Did you know where Mr. Kelly's property was specifically, or did you just generally know the area? Both. Both. Okay. Had you ever been to Mr. Kelly's property? Yes. When had you gone to Mr. Kelly's property? Uh, that was numerous occasions over the, my career with the sheriff's office and that maybe a drive through uh, at the inception of my career with the county attorney's office. Okay. Had you seen Mr. Kelly's house? Yes. And so you knew where it was and you're familiar with what it looks like? Yes. Okay. Um, were you provided any information in your review of these reports about where the body was located in relationship to the house? No. Okay, so that was not part of the background information that you had? No. Were you provided with any information regarding how the body was positioned when the body was discovered? If, if I was brief on that, I, I don't recall the, uh, that briefing. Okay. Um, were you aware of where this property and where the house specifically is in location or in relationship to the border wall? Yes. And where is it in relationship to the border wall? I couldn't tell you exactly. It's only approximately from, from the border. Approximately how far I away is it? Less than a mile. Less than a mile, approximately? Yes. Yes. Um, and this is also obviously on the east side of Nogales, right? That's correct. Okay. So that's the information that you had when you go into this interview with Daniel, right? That's correct. And when you interviewed Daniel, do you recall doing that interview? I do. And I'm just going to ask you about some of the statements um, that you made to Daniel in that interview, okay? Were you able to review a copy of the transcript of that interview prior to your testimony? No. If you need to refresh your recollection and you need to look at a transcript, just let me know, okay? And I, I, can, I can put it up in front of you, all right? I will. Do you recall... Um, Daniel telling you in this interview that this took place west of Nogales. Objection, Your Honor. Improper impeachment. I have the transcript. And it's not for impeachment purposes, Your Honor. It's to show how this detective responded, given his knowledge of the case, to that statement. And what was that exact question again was, did you... Did he recall Daniel telling him in the interview that this took place west of Nogales? All right. Overruled. He can answer. And, Your Honor, if I may... Could we talk on the headset about this? All right.
Objections overruled. Uh, you can re ask the question again so it's fresh in the witness's mind. So during this interview on February 23rd, do you recall asking Daniel where this took place? And do you recall him stating west of Nogales? I, would see, I have to see the transcript. All right. Can you put this in front of the witness? Let me see if I can jump to the right page. Okay, so I'm on page 18. Okay, let me have There's the bottom. So if it goes bottom of 18 over to the top of 19. And again, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is being used to refresh the witness's recollection. It's not admitted into evidence, so that's why it's not on your screen. Can you repeat the question, please? Let me find it real quick. I think I'm on the wrong page. I'm on the wrong page. There we go. Okay. So the question is, you asked the witness, where did this take place? And he said, west. Is that right? I'm looking at line uh, five, six right there. Yes. Okay. So he told you this took place west of Nogales. And can you take a look at line seven for me? Seven, eight. Yes. And that's you translating the witness's statement. Is that right? Yes. And you translated that as east. Is that right? <coughs> yes. Even though you confirmed in Spanish, oeste, so you, you repeated that to him in Spanish. Yes. But then you translated that as east. Yes. Why did you now do let's, that? I'll stop you. I just want to get an official, I, you know, I think everyone probably, oh. most everyone <laughs> knows what that means. But um, So the word in the transcript that the witness said was oeste, correct? Yes. All right. Can we ask that? Court interpreter to translate oeste. Translate the word oeste. West. All right. What's the word for east? Este. All right, thank you. <coughs> Apologies, you can go ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. So you incorrectly <coughs> stated what this witness had said. Why did you do that? I couldn't ex give you an exp explanation of that. You don't know? No. Is it possible that it had to do with the fact that you were familiar with this area and you knew that the area in question was to the east of Nogales? Possibly. And then you ask the witness another question. I'm going to jump to page 41. Give me one moment. Find the line. <clears throat> oh, this is off. Give me one moment, Judge. I think it's taken me to the wrong page. Okay, so I'm looking at page 40. You were asking the witness some questions about distance. And do you agree that you're telling the witness the distance, I'm looking at line 14 to line 15. That's something that you're telling the, dis, telling the witness, right? I'm just affirming his recollection. 
Well, you're saying, could it be the distance? Could it be more? Because seven Objection, meters... Your Honor. Improper impeachment, again. I'm asking about this witness's statements, not right. about Daniel's statements. Right. Well, objections overruled. But ask the question first, you know, what did the witness tell you, or did the witness tell you this, this, and this, and what did you tell him? Just ask for his recollection first, and then if necessary, you can try to refresh his recollection with the transcript. Do you recall telling Daniel at some point in the interview that he could possibly be wrong about distance because the distance he was giving you was not very much? I wasn't telling. Uh, I was asking, could it be the uh, distance? Could it be more? It Why were you asking him that? Uh, Open-ended question as to uh, his recollection. Well, he had previously given you a statement about a distance, right? Do you want me to scroll up so you can see that? Yes. So do you see around line 10 to 13, just if you could read that for yourself so you can refresh your recollection about the conversation? So the conversation in general, and I don't want to get into what the witness actually told you, but you're in general talking about a distance in this case, right? That's correct. And you're talking about a distance from the border wall, right? That's correct. He gave you a distance, right? That's correct. And then later you tell him, are you sure it was that close? Could it have been more? Something like that, right? That's correct. Why did you do that? Because sometimes victims' recollections are, are different uh, days, weeks afterwards, uh, just to affirm his, his statement as to distance. Well, when you say, are you sure it was that close, do you believe that's suggestive to the witness? I believe it's, it's I was trying to elicit his detailed response to my question. Well, he had previously given you a detailed response about a distance from where he was to the border wall, right? That's correct. But you, you didn't accept that. You asked him, are you sure it was that close? It's a term of, of interview with the victims to reaffirm uh, their statement. Don't you believe that that's a little bit suggestive when you say, are you sure it was that close? The question is subjective as to the response, and so I would say it's just my interview with, with the victim. Well, let me ask you this. He gives you this distance away from the border wall that this happened. When you heard that, based on your knowledge of the area, and you know the, the ranch, you know where it is in relationship to the border wall, based on his statement, did you believe that that statement made sense with the knowledge that you had of the area? To, to the victim, it made sense. But to you, did it make sense? No. Okay, because you know the area, right? Yes. And the distance he was giving you was way too close to the border wall to make sense. That's correct. And so you said, are you sure you were that close? Or words to that effect, right? That's correct. Okay. My pages are off, so give me a moment. I hope I can find this one. Do you at some point, you talk to him about a distance that a person, specifically the shooter was, when the shooter was shooting at him, right? Do you recall having a conversation with him about that? Yes, ma'am. And he gave you another distance in that instance, right? I believe so. Then, do you recall asking him or doing something similar with that distance, saying, are you sure you were that close? That's really close. Do you recall a conversation to that effect? That's correct. And was that sort of the same scenario? He's giving you a distance that doesn't make sense based on what you understand, and so you're asking him if he's really sure about that. That's correct. Fair enough? Okay. Do you remember at some point 
um, during this interview, taking him outside to measure some distances? That's correct. Why did you do that? Just to have the knowledge of his perception of distance. And how was his perception of distance? I believe it wasn't accurate. It was or was not accurate? It, it was not accurate. Okay. And why did you believe that? He was just nervous. He, uh, I don't know. I think it was just his demeanor as, as to uh, his well, exposure to, to the interview. Itself. I'm, I'm asking you, what about his perception of distance do you believe was not accurate? You, let me back up a little bit. You take him outside to actually measure something. Just do you recall measure, that? Just, just, I just asked him, uh, what do you believe this distance is? And did you measure that to see if he was accurate? It was approximate. I didn't uh, measure it. What was the distance that you asked him to estimate for you? I couldn't recall without. Okay. Do you, do you know how far off he was? He was not accurate. How, how so? Just by him, uh, re his response uh, to my questions as to the, what's uh, 15 meters. Well, that was a distance you asked him about where he was in relation to the border wall when the shooting happened, right? No, that, that was 15 meters that you have right here okay, before me. Okay, so I just want to talk about when you take him outside to determine if he's accurate with distance. How did you do that? I'd ask him how, how much is 10 meters. And what did he do? He pointed out to a wall and he said that was about 8 meters. Okay, and did you measure that distance to see no. if he was accurate? No. So how do you know that he's not good with distances? Because I, the interpretation of my 8 meters were not the same as his 10 meters. I'm just trying to figure out what you did. So. During this interview, he's making some statements about distance that don't make sense based on what you know about the facts of the case, right? That's correct. And so you take him outside of the interview to try to come to some determination about how good he is with distances. That's correct. If I were to do that, you know, I might look at the distance from here to the bench, and I might say, how much would you estimate that to be? And I would get an estimate, and then I would go measure it to see how close he was. Did you do anything like that? No, I could not because we were at the, at the port of entry uh, at our office and it was busy, so it was just approximate. It so what did you do? I just, like I said, it was from uh, the outside of that little uh, office that we were in uh, to a wall that's within the building that, that we were in. Okay, so you had him entry. estimate some distance. Yes. Do you recall what his estimate was? I don't recall. Do you recall what your estimate was of that distance? I don't recall. Do you recall how far off those two estimates were? They were not the same. How far off were they? One meter, two meters, how far off? I, I, since I didn't, you know, repeat the question to him or I did it, I just assumed that my interpretation as to what was five meters or 10 meters was not the same with it. Okay. Well, so how do you know he's off if you don't know how far off because he was? Because we couldn't get into, he couldn't accurate give me a, a, a distance that was uh, accurate and I didn't try to pursue that issue at any point. When you're saying he couldn't give you a distance that was accurate, you mean when you take him outside and have him estimate? Your Honor, Aston answered. Uh, no, he hasn't answered, so overruled. The distance that we're talking about that he gave you that was not accurate, you're saying it was from a point that he estimated? Yes. But you don't know what that estimation was? No. How do you know it's not accurate? Just my interpretation of that distance that we were looking at. How different was your interpretation from his? I would say... Less than a meter. Okay, so you and he were pretty close. But not accurate. Okay. So he's giving you a distance, 15 meters, let's say. 
He's not going to make an error like 15 meters is really a mile and a half. He's not that far off, is he? Yes. Yes, he is that far off? 15 meters to mile and a half is not the same. Right. My question is, Daniel, even if he's not perfectly accurate with his estimation of distances, he's not that far off based on what you observed in this interview, right? You would have to ask Daniel. Do you recall at one point in this interview saying that you need to take a t like time out? Do you recall saying that in this interview? I don't remember. Do you need to refresh your recollection? Yes. My page numbers, I wrote the citations down. For some reason, they're off. So let me see if I can find it. Council, let's just jump on the headset for scheduling purposes. All right, we're going to take our 30-minute mid-morning recess. It's um, 9.45. We'll be back here. Please be in the jury room at 10.15. And we'll continue with the examination of this witness. We're in recess for 30 minutes.
Everyone's here. You can bring in the jury, please. Right. Please be seated. The records show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and the defendant. Witnesses retaking the witness stand. <coughs> and... Um, As soon as he's ready and you're ready, you can continue with your direct examination. Can you still hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, just going back to this interview, and I think we got the right pages figured out now, but um, do you recall at some point in this interview saying, hang on, time out? Do you recall that? Yes. And... Why did you say time out in this interview? Just to take a break. Did you, after you said time out, and I'm looking at page 43 there, line 19 and down, you said time out, knowing the logistics, he might be confused. And because he was running away from Border Patrol, his, his logistics, where he was, because he doesn't know where he's at. You recall making that statement? Yes. So you're providing an explanation for something that this witness is telling you, right? Interpretation. So why do you provide that interpretation? Because I believe he was confused. Why did you believe he was confused? Because his statement. His statement didn't make sense. Is that what you're saying? Parts of it. And so you were trying to provide an explanation for why it's not making sense. I was just trying to get his information, not interpretation. Well, and you say that his logistics weren't making sense, right? Yes. And they, they weren't making sense, what he was saying, right? As to... What wasn't making sense about what he was saying? Just the distance. <laughs> Meaning what? I don't believe they were accurate. Okay. So they weren't accurate based on your knowledge of the area. Is that right? Based on my experience. Okay. Did you say at some point that maybe his locations were not defined as you might think? <coughs> were I'm looking at page, the page that's in front of you, line five, if you just go ahead and read that to refresh your recollection. Okay. And so you're telling him, or are you telling him that, or you're saying that his locations might not be as defined as you might think? That's not what it says. I'm looking at line five to seven. Okay, seven does say that. Okay, so, and this is a sidebar you're having with the prosecutor in this interview, right? You're not telling this to Daniel. I believe so. Okay, <coughs> and then do you later tell the, you explain something to Daniel about what you're telling the prosecutor in this interview? And I'm looking at line 11 through 12. Do you recall that? I'm 
And I'm going to scroll up for you, okay? Yes. And are you, you're telling him that he wasn't paying attention when he was fleeing. I'm asking. You're asking him if, if he was paying attention when he was fleeing? Yes. Is that what he said? Did he acknowledge that? Did he say, that's right, I wasn't paying attention? Do you recall? I don't see it on this page. Okay. Do you, I'm just asking if you recall. Do you remember him saying that? <coughs> Can you repeat the question, please? Do you remember him agreeing with you and saying, yes, that's right, I wasn't paying attention because I was fleeing or something like that? More or less. <coughs> Do you recall at some point telling the prosecutor in this interview that Daniel's thought pattern is not like ours? Do you want me to pull up that page? Please. It even, hi it even highlighted it for some reason. <laughs> okay, so just take a look at that and refresh your recollection. Yes. Okay, why did you tell the prosecutor that his thought pattern is not like ours? What did you mean by that? As to our uh, interview and his statement. Meaning what? Tell me, tell me what that means. He couldn't explain uh, what occurred. Why do you think he couldn't explain what occurred? He wasn't in detail with his, uh, with his statement with, as to what occurred. When you say in detail, what do you mean? It was, he was very brief. He was very nervous. He was, it, it took a while to get uh, him to be comfortable with the interview. Well, so he did provide some details to you. For example, that 15-meter distance, that was a detail he provided to you, right? Yes. So it was, a, it was detailed, it was just not correct. Is that right? No. He says 15, this happened 15 meters away from the border wall, right? That's a detail he provided, right? Yes. And that detail, it's just not correct. It's not correct. It's not that it's not detailed. It's not correct. Did that ever concern you? So you have this whole interview. Um, you provide him with some explanations. You're saying his thought pattern's not like ours. You take him outside to try to get him to narrow in his distance or to try to judge how good he is with distance. Did it ever concern you that what he said just didn't make sense? No. Why didn't that concern you? Because he was a victim of a crime, and it was probably hard for him to interpret. How do you know he was a victim of a crime? Because I was brief on this case, and he was identified as the victim. By who? How do you know he was a victim of a crime? Because he was mentioned as the victim of this crime. Who before. mentioned him as the victim? If I, if I remember correctly, I, I read the reports. Somebody can make a false report to law enforcement and claim to be a victim of a crime. That's possible, right? Yes. And before you had this interview with Daniel, you were aware of two other potential witnesses who had come forward. We've talked about that already, right? Miguel and Ramon, right? That's correct. Daniel doesn't ever mention Miguel and Ramon to you, right? Or he says, let me rephrase that. Based on what you hear from him, your understanding is Daniel's the only one present when this shooting takes place, right? No. Who else? Besides Gabriel. Daniel and Gabriel. Objection, Your Honor. I, I'm having a hard time figuring out how this is an improper impeachment again, and what the purpose of this line of questioning is. And, Your Honor, the purpose of the line of questioning is to 
explore how the detective treats a witness statement. He provides explanations and he provides reasons and he tells the witness the reasons why the witness is being incorrect instead of pursuing this witness as a potential suspect or as a potential person who's making a false report. So it's about, thank you. (laughs) And Your Honor, the state's position is that this is just an end run around letting Daniel explain the statement. They didn't confront him with the statement and this is just an end run around that. Jackson's overruled. Thank you. So when you interviewed Daniel, was it your understanding from him that he and Gabriel are the only two people present when this shooting takes place? Not that I recall. You don't remember if he said there were other people there or other witnesses? You don't remember? He did mention there was other witnesses, but the way you presented the the question is that there was never anybody other than them present. Other than who? Daniel and the victim. You're telling, you're saying that Daniel somehow told you that there were other witnesses present during the shooting besides him and Gabriel? Based on his statement that when he crossed with a group of people. I'm talking about when the shooting happens, not when he crosses. I don't recall if, if he mentioned anything with other people there at, at, at the shooting. You don't recall. Okay. No. If he were to tell you he's the only witness to this event, but you know that there are two other statements out there, does that concern you? Yes. Why does that concern you? Because there's other witnesses. And those statements are not consistent? I don't know the other statement from the other witness. If the statements are inconsistent, that's a concern, If right? the statements are... And why is that a concern? It's something for the court to address. What about you as a detective? Is it a concern as a detective when multiple people have different statements about an event? Yes. Why is it a concern to you as a detective? Because you want to elicit the truth. And if multiple statements are inconsistent with one another, does that mean one or, one or more of those statements might not be true? Could you repeat the question? If multiple statements are inconsistent with one another, does that mean that one or more of those statements might not be true? That's possible. What do you do to test a person's credibility? Let's say you're concerned. Let's say someone comes forward with statements and those statements do not make sense according to the facts that you know about the case. What do you do to test that person's credibility? There's various things that, uh, that you could do. By, what are some know, of those things? You know, what is his uh, background? How long did he go to uh, school? If he can properly describe something to 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 me during a, a interview, there's a lot of factors that come into it. Okay, so if he can properly describe something to you, what do you mean when, when you say that? Exactly what I'm. Uh, you're asking me to do with you is that if you elicit a, you ask a question, then. I give you an answer to that question. So let's say, for example, I'm in the interview. I know this happened east of Nogales. I ask this person, where did this happen? He says west. Could you possibly bring out a map and say, can you show me where this happened? Yes. That'd be one way to maybe test the person's credibility, right? That's correct. Did you do that with this witness? No, ma'am. Why not? I didn't have a map. Could you go on Google Earth and get one? Not at the border. Did you do any follow-up with this problem, this West versus East problem? Did you follow up with this witness? I did not. Why not? I wasn't tasked to do the follow-up on that, on this interview. If a witness says, for example, somebody else was there, there was another person who was a member of the group, 
and if you know who an alleged other member of the group is, could you do a photo lineup to see if the witness could identify that person? Yes. That'd be another way to test this person's credibility, right? Yes. Did you do that? No. <coughs> Did you try to have the witness do a photo identification of Mr. Kelly at any point? No. Why not? I wasn't tasked to do that. Do you know if anyone was ever tasked with doing that? No, ma'am. These, these multiple, I guess these areas of concern. So you're talking to this witness, and what he's saying doesn't make sense. He's talking about distances to the border wall that don't make sense. He's talking about locations that are on the other side of town that don't make sense. When you provided him and the prosecutor in this interview with explanations, why did you do that instead of testing his credibility? It was based on just the interaction I had with the, with the victim at that point. It, I didn't think it was... It was needed at that point. And that's because you just assumed he was a victim? Based on his statement. I don't have anything else, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Um, Cross-examination from the state. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective, if the, def if the victim, Daniel, had identified the defendant in court the following day, after this interview, would it have been necessary to do a follow-up with a photo lineup? No, it wouldn't be necessary. Do you know if that occurred? If you know? No, I don't know. But if that occurred, you'd agree that wouldn't be necessary? Objection That's asked good. and answered. Sustained. Defense counsel asked you about some photo lineups. Do you know if photo lineups were done uh, to determine if some other individuals were with him that day? I if you know. know. I do not know. You weren't tasked with doing one, but there were lots of other detectives on this case. Is that right? That's correct. So if they did a photo lineup, you don't know about it? No, ma'am. You talked about the, the port and not having a map available. Do you recall why that was? At the Dicasini uh, Port of Entry, uh, second floor. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't hear what he said. He said at the Dicasini Port of Entry, second floor. Right. So we were at the Dicasini Port of Entry, second floor. Were there issues, um, were there reasons why we weren't able to connect? Yes, it's a... Uh, Kind of at the border, it's a no man's land. A cell phone uh, service is not available. It's kind of sketchy there. Cell phone service is kind of it's, sketchy. It's almost no. Okay. Now I want to go back to your interview with Daniel. Do you? Re recall Daniel describing other things about the location of where this incident occurred and where he was that day? Yes. Did Daniel describe for you crossing the border at the end of the border wall? Yes. Did he describe for you going to an area he called Washington? Yes. Are you familiar with an area called Washington Camp? Yes. Where is that in relation to the end of the border wall? Approximately a mile and a half away. And which Parts direction? Of, uh, be due north. So just north of the end of the border wall is wa the area called Washington Camp. That's correct. Um, did he also talk to you about an area called Keno Springs during your interview? Yes. And where is Keno Springs in relation to the end of the border wall? Approximately two miles west, northwest of the border. The end of the border wall? The end of the border wall, yes. So, and where is Keno Springs and Washington Camp and the end of the border wall in, that, are, that are close to those in relation to Nogales? It's, it's east of Nogales. So when Daniel told you 
He was at Washington Camp and Keno Springs and the end of the border wall, but that occurred west of Dogalis. Which thing did you think was correct? That he was east. Okay. So when Daniel described Keno Springs, do you recall him describing the area at all? Yes. What do you remember him describing? Uh, descriptions of the, the row of uh, houses. Um, Did he describe some pine trees in the area? In the hills. If you recall. Yes. And would it refresh your recollection if I showed you uh, the transcript? Yes. Showing the witness what's been marked as State's Exhibit 18 on page 133. If you could take a look at the, at the bottom of page 133 um, and the top of page 134. Let me know when you want me to advance it. Go ahead. Does that refresh memory? Yes. And can you tell me what Daniel said about the houses with the pine trees? That it was close where uh, Gabriel died or it was farther uh, from Gabriel. That was line nine. And then... You're on thirty uh, one thirty five now. Yes. So what did he? What was the eventual answer about where the house with the pine trees were? After you were able to explain to him what your question was. The house was farther away as. Uh, in reference to the pine trees. Okay. So the house with the pine trees was farther away from where Gabriel died. Is that what the transcript says? That's correct. Tell me about what Daniel told you his educational experience was. That he attended school up to sixth grade. And what did he tell you he did for a living? That he worked on farms. As a farmhand? As a farmhand. Did you, did you talk to Daniel about the sequence of events and have concerns as you talked to him about his ability to do distances? Yes. Did he describe for you running from the Border Patrol um, in Washington camp to the Keno Springs area? Yes. And did he describe that he ran for about 30 minutes? Yes. And I want to go specifically to a page, page 31.
Did you ask him about when he crossed, initially crossed the border wall? Yes. And when he talked to you about crossing the border wall, did you ask him where he went? Yes. And are you familiar with that area? Yes. And did he describe crossing the border wall and going up a hill? That's correct. And then did he describe that as 10 to 15 meters? That's correct. Was that accurate? No. And he said he was about halfway up the hillside. Is that right? That's correct. And did he describe for you um, that there was a horse between him and the shooter during your interview? Yes. And then when you spoke to him, he said that the shooter was seven meters away. Is that right? Not on this page, but on the previous one counsel showed you. Yes. Would that make sense if the horse is between him and the shooter? Objection that argument. It's only seven, cent, seven meters? Objection sustained. Would it be possible for the horse to be between him and the shooter if it was only seven meters? It's possible. It is possible? It is possible. Okay. Is that likely? Yes. It's likely that he's that close and there's a horse in between? Objection no. asked and answered. Sustained. That's his answer. And what did Daniel tell you about um, how he was feeling at the time he got shot at? He was in fear of, of his life. And before he got shot, did he tell you what his health was like at that point because of fleeing from the Border Patrol? He was tired. He, and did he indicate to you that he was sick? I object, he, Judge. There needs to be a non-hearsay purpose for this. Judge, we're, the defense is challenging the witnesses, um, the witnesses' distances and whether this witness did something improper with um, suggesting that the witnesses distances were off, when in reality there are a lot of reasons why this witness's distances were not appropriate. And that's what I'm eliciting. The witness was sick. Let's do, let's do a, let's do a brief, brief bench conference here.
Excuse me. The objection sustained. One more thing. Let's go on the headset one more thing. I'm sorry. I forgot. Detective, were there numerous times during this interview that it was very clear that the Daniel's ability to judge distances was inaccurate? That's correct. Do you know anything about the other witnesses' statements that the defense asked you about, Ramon or Miguel? No. Were you tasked with assisting and tracking down Miguel and the number that was provided to 911? Yes. And what did you discover when you tried to call that number? If I remember correctly, uh, a uh, person answered and uh, didn't answer after I identified myself. They hung up? Yes. And what about Ramon? What, did you assist the sheriff's department in att attempting to track down an individual named Ramon? That's correct. What did you do? Uh, we, I, I believe Ramon was uh, living in Nogales, Sonora. We, we called uh, the number listed, and his mother uh, answered. When you interviewed Daniel, um, what was his demeanor like that day? Very nervous, very uh, almost sick uh, to, to the point of doing the interview that, that he was not well. Did he, what did you attribute that to? He, he said that we, he was still uh, suffering uh, some mental issues because of the shooting. Did he talk to you about um, nightmares? Yes. And did he talk to you about other physical ailments he was having as a result? Yes. Uh, his. Um, yes. And what were the physical ailments he talked about? Objection hearsay. That's all I had, Your Honor. Redirect examination. Thank you. Real quick, the state was um, asking you some questions about photo lineups and if you knew whether Daniel was ever presented with a photo lineup that included Ramon. And you said you didn't know about that, right? That's correct. 
If Daniel were provided with a photo lineup that included Ramon, and if Daniel was not able to identify Ramon, would that be an additional concern to you? Again, Your Honor, this calls for speculation and foundation. Overruled. So you can answer. Yes. That would be an additional concern. Yes. The state was asking you about some pine trees or some of Daniel's statements regarding pine trees. And can you put this up in front of the witness, Valeria? I'm just going to show you this portion of the same transcript involving pine trees. You go ahead, read that, and let me know if I need to scroll. Uh, which line? Go ahead and start at line 4 and go until line 17. And out of fairness, uh, for what purpose is this statement of Daniel being offered? Uh, Your Honor, it's again not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. It's clearly not true. The statement is saying... Okay, that's fine. You've said enough. Thank you. Okay. Did you get a chance to read that? Yes. So Daniel, when he talks about pine trees, do you recall he's telling you he is near some pine trees that are right up against the little road that goes right along the edge of the wall. Your Honor, just for the record, this is a different reference, so if we could have the page reference for the record. This is a different time in the transcript and a different reference. Page 118. Do you see that where he's saying... There are pine trees that are right up against the little road that goes right along the edge of the wall. Do you see that? No, I don't see that. Line six. It says, like some pine trees that were right up against the little road that goes right along the edge, and then there's uh uh-huh, uh-huh, that goes, line 12, that goes along all of the edge of the wall. And I went running along that edge, and then I was looking. I looked, I saw that person. uh, On line 10, he says that uh, he's going through the, where the wall is, and then he, he uh, was running all to the edge. And that, that's when he, he saw that uh, person. I don't, I don't see where he... All right, let's, let's publish this page to the jury. I think sure. that it's, this is... I'm exercising discretion in this regard because um, I think it's relevant to the examination. Just this page. Okay, fair enough. So Daniel is telling you that he sees some pine trees that are against the edge of the road that goes next to the wall. Is that fair to say? On which line does that say? Just one second. For the jurors, this again is another demonstrative exhibit. This is just to try to aid with your understanding of this examination of this witness on this point in the testimony. This is not evidence itself, but it's just demonstrative. So you can understand what the questions are directed to. Your Honor, can we go on the headset, please? Yes.
You can go ahead. Thank you. So you see line six where Daniel says, I mentioned before like some pine trees that were right up against the little road that goes right along the edge, and then I'm going to line 12, that goes along all of the edge of the wall, and I went running all along that edge. And then I was looking, and I looked, I saw that person. So he's describing seeing pine trees on the edge of the border wall, correct? Correct. No, it's two different issues there. He's describing the, the pine trees where he was, uh, and the, the muro is, if I look at it correctly, on line 10, he's saying that he's going through the edge of the muro. He's and, running and along. And he's describing, if you don't mind. He's describing when he's at the wall, when he was at first talking where the pine trees were. So, so when he, he jumps, says... He jumps his statement as to where he was. So I understand that's your explanation. But what he states is there are some pine trees that are right up against the little road that goes right along the edge of the wall. That's his statement. Right? That's let, what he says, right? Let's have, the, let's have the certified court interpreter yeah. interpret those lines from English and from Spanish into English. All right, so... Um, that would be line 1 through 3 and line 10 through 11. Right. We got. We got to. We got to have, make sure you record it. And uh, you, where's it? Give him the microphone, please. Your Honor, for interpreting this certification, you would like me to interpret line one, two, three, uh, ten, and, ten and, eleven. and eleven. Okay. Correct. But we need. We need to. We need to make sure you're projecting and you're recorded. So we need you to. Thank you. Bueno. The, the, it was at the same time in, in the same area where I was, where I went up the, then when is it that I come out of the wash? I went up, there were some, um, some trees. What can I tell you uh, the last time when it was like pines that were next to the little highway? that goes along the edge, that goes along the edge where the wall is, and I went running by the edge, and then I was looking, and then so when I looked, I was looking at the person. Thank you. All right, you can resume the questioning. Thank you. So he's describing running away from this shooting, looking back when he's at the end of the wall, and seeing the person, right? Yes. And you know, based on your familiarity with the area and based on where that property is, that that's not possible, right? That's correct. It's just, it's not possible to be at the end of the wall and look back and see Mr. Kelly's property, right? I wasn't there, ma'am, but that's what he said. Okay. Did you have concerns about that when you got this statement? Not at that time. Why not? Because we were conducting the interview. Well, if a witness says something that's obviously impossible based on what you know about the evidence, that causes concern, right? Yes. And he's not just you know, making errors in distance. He's placing himself in a physical spot that he knows, the end of the wall, right? The road that goes along the end of the wall. Yes. That's not a mistake that you make because you have a sixth grade education, right? If I say I'm at the end of the wall, but really I'm up on a mountain somewhere, that's a big problem, right? Yes. 
So when you see this statement, you're not concerned that this person might be making a false report? And that's why the interview continues. Well, maybe this person wasn't there. Is that possible? I believe he was there. Even though he's making these impossible statements? That's why we were having the in interview. Did it ever occur to you that maybe he wasn't there? Yes. Why did that occur to you? For the same reasons that you're giving me. And what did you do to explore that possibility? We continued with the interview. And th during this interview, you came to the conclusion that he really was there? That's correct. Even though he says, I'm at the end of the wall when I look back and I see the shooter. And even though he says, I'm 15 meters away from the border wall when this shooting happens, you still think he was really there? He couldn't articulate that, that point of view. Well, he articulated 15 meters pretty well, right? Yes, he did. And he articulated the end of the wall pretty well, right? Yes, he did. He even mentioned the pine trees, so he's adding detail, right? Exactly. And yet you still think that he was there? Correct. Even when he says the shooter was seven meters away from me, you, you still think he was there? I believe so. You said that he provided numerous, or there were numerous times in this interview that you were concerned about his ability to determine distance, right? That's what you told the prosecutor, right? That's correct. But that's not because when you actually measured distance, he was very far off. That's correct. That's just because he's telling you things that you know are wrong based on the scene, correct? Correct. I don't have anything else, Your Honor. And limiting, another limiting instruction I should have given it when you, when you saw this page of the transcript, the statements of Daniel that are being offered by the defense are not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. They're being offered for the opposite purpose. So therefore, as I've defined hearsay for you before, it's not hearsay because it's not offered for the truth of what Daniel said. It's offered to so show that it's the opposite, not true. All right. And, Your uh, Honor, based on counsel's argument, I want to um, again make the argument um, with respect to this transcript. And if the court wants to do that on the headset, I'm happy to do that. But based on the continuing questioning, all right. I need um, to make a record. First, let's, any questions for this witness from the jurors? All right, seeing none, you can still think about it. We'll go on the transcript. Oh, excuse me, we'll go on the headset briefly. All right, we're back on. All right, you all right, Denise? Yeah. All right. Oh, there's something else? I'm sorry. Hold on one second.
All right, we're back on the record before the jury. Um, no questions for this witness, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? All right, I see none. Then, then uh, sir, you can um, step down. But hold on a second, because we're going to take a recess. The lawyers and I have some work to do um, before we take the next step. So um, it should be about maybe 15 or 20 minutes. don't know exactly. But we'll bring you back in. If it's close to lunch, we'll just recess for lunch. Hopefully, we'll be able to come back and, and do something else before lunch. But there's a little bit of work we have to do. You know, there's just some things. There's some things that uh, the court, the judge, and I have to do with the lawyers, and they have to occur at certain points in the trial. Um, sometimes they're inconvenient points for purposes of taking a break. But they have to be done. It can't be done ahead of time. It can't be done later. It has to be done right now. So that's why we're doing this right now. So uh, we will stand in recess for about 20 minutes to a half hour, I'm guessing, roughly. Um, and as soon as we're ready to go, we'll have you come back in. We'll stand in recess. Thank you. And then the witness afterwards will sit down. Right before.